。はい。なるほど。Okay, so, so I'm going to be talking about this relativistic reconnection.、Um, and、uh, in the past, I've been looking mostly with explicit codes, but now we're, we're, I'm investigating how you could use semi implicit methods for relativistic、uh, problems.、Um, and yeah, so I've been working with Maria Elena and also、uh, Fabio Bacchini,、um, who you may know、both、from here.、Um, okay, so. And both of them were、uh, La Penta students? Yeah. Well, I did. Okay. okay, so I'm going to divide、uh, this presentation into、uh, three main parts. So, first, I'm going to introduce the semi implicit pick method um, and uh, also. How you can use this for a relativistic case and when you want to use it, when you might not want to.、Um, and then I'm going to try to show that the code that we're looking at works well with、um, uh, compared to an explicit code.、Um, and I'm going to use a couple different examples to see this. And one of them is the, through the tearing instability. So I'm going to give a, a fair amount of the talk where I'm just investigating what we expect from the tearing instability in, in a, an explicit. Uh, simulation so that we can see if this matches well.、Uh, and finally, I'm going to compare some methods with both using the explicit and implicit and show that it could be advantageous.、Um, and then look in, a little bit into what we could look forward to seeing in the future. Okay, so、uh, what you normally think of for a particle and cell code、um, that's explicit、um, is that you have this、uh, particle and cell loop、uh, where you Uh, we'll step the,、uh, the momentum、uh, using the momentum equation. Then you deposit the current into, and、uh, use this to then step the、uh, Maxwell's equations and then interpolate this back.、Um, and this, this works very nicely,、uh, but it turns out that when we've tried to find this u at a future time, we're using the previous times here.、Um, and This, this works well as long as you、uh, resolve your time steps、uh, very well in, in the space.、Um, and if you don't do that, you get instabilities like、uh, numerical heating.、Um, now, in an implicit、uh, method, rather than doing these all separate,、uh, you can solve these, these problems where these equations kind of in unison, where we're keeping into account. Self consistently, the future and the previous time of both the momentum and the field.、Um, and this allows us to avoid these instabilities.、Um, and then you can take、uh, advantage of this fact by under resolving some of the smaller scales that you don't uh, necessarily uh, or aren't necessarily important for your problem.、Um, and so, as long as that's the case, you can, you can really get some savings in, in your computational、uh, method. So, what can we under resolve?、Um, so, normally in, in, a,、um, in an explicit code, you, you kind of want to resolve all of these、uh, scales. So, the, the Debye length,、uh, the electron, and the ion inertial length.、Um, you can sometimes get away with not quite resolving the Debye length. And what's important is that you don't get too much numerical heating.、Um, but when we use this implicit method, we can often.、Uh, You don't need to resolve this Debye scales.、Uh, and we can sometimes just resolve the ion scales、uh, if we're not so concerned with what's happening at、uh, electron scales. And so I wrote down here the equations for the Debye length, the electron inertial, and the ion inertial length. And you can see here that you can get a savings, which depends on the ratio of the thermal velocity to the speed of light and the, the ratio of the mass ratio, square,、uh, the square root of that.、Um, now, as a rule of thumb, these Implicit schemes tend to be maybe about 10 times slower if you have everything constant. Per, per time step? Per, per time step, yeah. So if you have the same problem with the same number of particles, the same resolution,、uh, it tends to be about 10 times slower than the same thing explicitly. But Just in terms of the algebraic, the number of algebraic operations. I think, it, yeah, yeah. Because of that. Because it's more complex. you're going to have to do this, this method of、uh, iterating where you have、no. to do several steps until it converges. Um, and 
And so it's a bit slower if you're doing that, but we would like to take advantage of, of the fact that we, we don't need to uh, resolve all of these things. Um, and so we get this factor f faster in each of the space directions. Um, and so you get the most benefit when you're doing a 3D simulation where you have all the different directions where you get this gain. Can you just say what semi is referring to? Okay, so yeah. So when, when we talk about the, okay, this is, this is something that I still need to, to get a complete grasp over what, what it means, but uh, you can divide up the these equations that we're looking up earlier and do some of it explicitly and some of it implicitly. Uh, and to do it fully implicitly tends to be very expensive and you can't do this 10 times. It's going to be much more expensive, um, but it, it can get rid of, uh, more of these instabilities, uh, I would say. Um, but this is something that actually is feasible to, to run where you, you can gain some benefit here. Um, so yeah. So there is still like some of that explicit loop, but you kind of put some of it into just all at the same time implicitly? Right, yeah. So we, we have all of those equations and you can, you do some of it implicitly, which gets rid of the, the key problems, mm -hmm. which causes these uh, big instabilities. But then some of it, you end up just doing explicitly. and uh, just makes it work well. So, uh, so Kevin, just maybe to help you out one second. Specific for IPIC, yeah. the, the solver is implicit, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the mover part of IPIC 3D is still explicit. Right. Yeah. And when you say just, for those of us who are not uh, familiar with this, you say the solver and the mover, right? These uh, sound like... Uh, so. <laughs> Right, so solver so, meaning so Maxwell's equations and mover means pushing particles. Is that what it means? What is the that's solver? Correct. With? Yeah, that's okay. correct. Okay. Yeah. So solver on the grid, right. solving electric and magnetic fields. Exactly. Yeah, solving the current. Okay. Solving yeah. the current. That's the yeah. Yeah. Part. yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then for the implicit, for the explicit part, you're saying the particles are basically leapfrogged, are they, with the field solution? Which is implicit? Um, yes, yes. I, I pick that's some sort of fancy leapfrogging. It's not the standard Boris solver. That's something more, yeah. uh, more fancy. Mm -hmm. But it's basically leapfrogging. Right. Yeah. The so with I pick three uh, D, you have this this uh, moment method that you use to solve it. Uh, where you have to make some assumptions. And I tried to look more into this for the relativistic case, but it seemed it's pretty challenging. Um, and yeah, what I'm going to talk about uh, maybe in the next slide is is how this this new code of Fabio Bacchini, uh, he's able to use this, this XM uh, code where we have the energy conservation, which is a different algorithm, which I still need to go into details to understand how it works. Uh, but um, but yeah, it, it's a bit slower than what you can get with IPIC 3D, but I think the energy is conserved, at least in in uh, the non-relativistic version. Um, and again, just so that everybody's yeah. on the same page, when you yeah. say IPIC 3D, is this, what is IPIC 3D? Is it the name of a code? This is the name of a code. Yeah. It's the appendix. Okay. And yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so so far I talked about the spatial resolution, but you can also gain in the time resolution. Uh, so normally, um, normally you have to uh, use this top top equation here to uh, solve to keep the current condition, uh, which will cause instabilities. Um, and there's two benefits here. One, since we're not resolving the space as much, we can have much less resolution in time. Uh, and second of all, we don't really even need to resolve this high. What's what's most important here is that not many particles will move from one grid to another within one time step. Um, and so it's it's really just the thermal velocity here. Although when it's relativistic, it turns to be the same thing. Hmm. Um, okay, an another thing that you can take advantage of, that this is just a, um, a cartoon of, of what you might be able to do. So if you're looking at, uh, a problem where we use non-standard grids. So for example, a log scale, or just in this picture, you say in regions where you're more interested, you have a lot of grids. And, and then out here, maybe the resolution is not as high, um, but so we- Non-uniform. Yeah, it's not non-uniform grid. Um, and so 
in, in this region, you would have kinetic effects important. Well, in this region, it's not so important. And something more like a fluid model would suffice. And so if you under-resolve uh, the problem here uh, and use a, an implicit method, you can, you can do some uh, cheaper simulations that you wouldn't be able to do if you were doing explicit and you would have instabilities out here. Is it all conditioned or also you can use uh, so, I mean, this is just a, a cartoon, and yeah, there are yeah. different codes. It could be Cartesian grids, it could be spherical. Um, like uh, the state board has other, like whatever the code in the top uh, yeah, Does it have, like, uh, Yeah, as, as far as I've used, it's just been Cartesian. Oh. Um, it, I, I don't know if there are some options that I haven't looked into, or if this is, this would be a future thing that we would like to do, uh, but, but just, Looking at the method, this is something that you can gain using using the implicit method. Okay, so then we look into this relativistic mode, and what 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 is the, the issues that we run into? Um, so, when we have to solve these equations uh, in the non-relativistic uh, regime, this is all linear. We have u, e, uh, and if if b is a, a constant. You can you can also have something that's quite linear there, uh, but when we have this gamma factor here, it becomes much more complicated, and it's difficult to uh, to solve this um, in order to do this implicit method. Um, well, in an explicit case, you can just calculate gamma and then move forward, and you may run into some instabilities, but it works well. Um, and so this is something that we can get around, but it's 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 more of a challenge. Um, and then the other thing that that's important to look here is uh, this gamma factor tends to reduce the scale separation. So if you have uh, electrons and ions that both have about the same temperature and they're highly relativistic, um, then you don't really get a gain by only resolving the one uh, the electron scale and not the ion scale. Um, and to that uh, to that point, then you can also get no benefit if you're looking at a pair plasma. Um, although some of the things that I talked about in the last page where you have these, these kind of non-standard grid, you could gain even with the paraplasm. Um, okay. Now, you, this isn't all bad. There are some things that we can look at. So uh, in moderately rel relativistic cases where the electrons are a bit relativistic and maybe the ions are not, although if they are, it would be even better. Uh, you can you can still get some separation and and some gains here, um, and in regimes where you have strong radiative cooling, then the electrons uh, would cool a lot while the ions don't, and then this might help retain uh, scale separation in some of these uh, systems that are more relativistic. Okay, so this is the the new code that uh, Fabio just just published a, a paper in archive uh, earlier this year. Um, and so basically this is, is a modified version of, uh, of XIM that uh, Le Penta published in 2017. Um, and so, yeah, XIM stands for uh, Energy Conserving Semi-Implicit Method. Um, and so in this case, it's, uh, Fabio decided we can, we can get rid of the X because it actually doesn't conserve energy anymore, but it, it conserved it very well, uh, nonetheless, even though there's a, some small errors there. Um, and, and so at this point, he has one, a, a code that runs, uh, and he tested it a bit. So these were two of the problems that he looked at in his paper. Uh, so he looked at the two stream instability, where we have relativistic beam of electrons going through a background uh, with ions and electrons that you have a return current. Um, and this is the this is the phase space, uh, and this matched the theory. Uh, he also tested some relativistic pair reconnection and was able to see things that, that uh, look like what you would expect. Um, and so I'm also going to look at these sort of problems using um, the code that I'm more familiar with, uh, which I'll show on the next page is Osiris. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Would you mind going to the previous page? Yes. Uh, did the XSIM original code from the pen to the was mm -hmm. that relativistic? No, was it? this, so this is a non-relativistic code. Okay. And so it's able to solve those, mm -hmm. that linear set of equations. Mm -hmm. And 
get this exact energy yeah. conservation. But when it's nonlinear, then you have some some issues there. Okay, so it was, but it was kind of fundamental. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, Kevin, do you know whether um, uh, Fabio's code is both relativistic in the mover and the solver, or only in the mover? Um, I should probably read this paper and find out, but I was wondering whether you know. Is there a difference? Yeah, in, in the Maxwell's um, equations, there is no uh, difference. Um, I mean, it's, it's not straightforward. You can just put the gamma in the mover, and then you have a relativistic code that's basically changing one line of code. But I mean, you can include a lot of vistic effects in the uh, in the in the solver as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's important here is that the mover is able to to solve this this equation, which is difficult when it's nonlinear. Uh, mm -hmm. In some of the other cases, when we we try to do things with IPIC three D, uh, then oftentimes it doesn't converge. Um, and so when when you have this like more linear type uh, method. Uh, it turns out that we have something that really you can you can run and get results. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I would say that it, it's fully relativistic here. Yeah, and is this the only such code in existence? Uh, as mean, far as I understand, yes. Uh, Same implicit uh, relativistic code. Right. There's been some papers in the past of, for example, I pick three D. Uh, where they were trying to put these uh, relativistic effects, but um, it, it was something that no one has ever really done any uh, production runs. Uh, it, it was just, in theory, this should work, but sometimes it doesn't converge. And so it was a bit bit of a problem. So it was kind yeah. of work in progress. And this is exactly sort of final product. Yeah. I mean, this one is a, a new method that seems to work. So it, uh, right now I'm looking more into to showing that it actually does give correct results. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, it looks like something that we can we can really get some interesting uh, simulations. You can't in the quite read the vertical scale on the two stream. Is that v over c? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This okay, is v so, over c. Yeah. So this is, I mean, it's relativistic, but it's not highly relativistic if it's all around, you know, point two five or something. Right. Right. Yeah, point, yeah. 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 I mean, really, to get the advantage, you don't want it to be super relativistic. Yeah. So no, but um, there's a, you know, when you're testing it, you really want to test it. Although the, possible, right? when when v is close to one, this is the most complicated, uh, right. where, where so you can't really say that you have down. right, right. Uh, so indeed, that's a good question. Uh, and, uh, yeah, does the code a... work well in uh, like ultra relativistic? Issue? Right. So I mean, I've gone to semi ultra, ultra not not so <laughs> so much, but maybe like uh, the. 10 times mc squared is the energy uh, or the temperature. So uh, it seems to work pretty well in some of these regimes. OK, so um, yeah, the, the next thing that I was saying that is, so OSIRIS is, is a massively parallel, fully relativistic, explicit code um, that was developed between UCLA and Technical in Lisbon. And so I've I've been talking just <laughs> yeah, just to make, make sure we kind of well, uh, avoid jar jargon. Yeah, would even call it jargon when uh -huh. you say technical. Nobody knows what it means. So it's, yeah, uh, so it's a it's the university where you were, right? Yeah, the university that I was working yeah. in Lisbon is called uh, University of Lisbon, and within it there is this. Uh, it, the, uh, is it separate from the university? So, it, it, it part of it? so when I when I moved there, they were two separate entities. There was uh -huh. the the Instituto Superior Técnico (IST) or Technical. Ah, okay. right. So normally people say technical there. Um, okay. And and then now it's combined with the University of Lisbon. Yeah. Uh, but that's the same institution, right? That's, right, right. I mean, there's where, where Louis Silva is, where you were. Where, yeah, yeah, right, where yeah. Osiris was developed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this, you see, this technical Lisboa, this oh, okay. is, or IST is the right. how it's uh, called. Um, but yeah, so so I've been working with this for the past ten years, um, and and using different different versions of this. And so it, it's been well tested. And so we can trust the, the results that we can get out of it. And so I'm using this um, as as a, a test to see whether this this new code is, is giving similar results or not. Yeah. OK, so just just to get a, a first picture of some of these things that we were looking at, I, I did a simulation that what we just showed earlier, which was this uh, 
this two stream instability where we have uh, so what I'm plotting here, I'm, I'm going to show a few plots like this, where we're looking at the the change in energy. So this is absolute value um, of of all of these different modes. So we have the electromagnetic field, which is the the thing that I'm measuring, which is growing due to the the two stream instability. Then you have the return current, the beam current, and the the ion kinetic energy. Um, and so this purple line is the fit, and the, the brown line is the the theoretical result. Uh, and so what's nice about this two stream is you have an exact theoretical result that you can compare uh, well in the, with, linear regime. in the linear regime exactly when we when we look at the tearing instability it's a bit more complicated so we have to rely a little bit more on the uh, simulations from osiris to see can, if it makes can sense. you give us an idea of what are what were the both velocities and temperatures in this okay so when you say yeah. linear, uh, sorry, when, when you say relativistic, what is relativistic? Is right. Just the beam relativistic? The plasma is not relativistic, right? Yeah, the beam, wait, the, what do you mean by the plasma is not relativistic? Uh, relativistically hot. Uh, no, no, it's not hot. So, okay, so, so that relativistically cold plasma. Yeah. The beam. With the beam that were, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was, but it was something like, like five times the, MC squared or something. So it, it's pretty relative. Okay, so relativistic yeah. bulk drift velocities. And so you, you, electrons and ions. So you have an ion, a background ion. Stationary ion. Uh, you have a beam uh, of electrons, which is something like five. And then you have this return current uh, that, that causes yeah. it. So you have no um, no net current. So the ions are very non-relativistic. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they start heating up as as all of this process happens. So you can see here that the ion kinetic energy is growing. Uh, it's not obvious that it's growing here, but um, it is. Um, and the, the electron beam energy is the one that's going down. Although, since I'm showing the absolute value, you don't see that in this plot. Uh, but the bottom line here is that this this is a reasonably good uh, yeah. agreement here. Um, and then I also did a test of the number of particles per cell, which there's not way too much that you can get out of this because I, I went from 78, 1,000, 8,000, 20,000, and you really get the same results in, in all of them. Uh, you just get a longer and longer uh, region where you can measure this growth rate. Uh, um, yeah. So Because you can measure it from a lower... Exactly. Lower energy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're we're just pushing down this initial state, so you have the longer and longer point until it it uh, saturates. And and okay, so since you will, you will presumably then we'll be comparing with the implicit situations. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the resolution here? Uh, agreed resolution, cell size. In terms okay. of so in, in this case, I uh, I was not trying to get the benefit of. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was just res resolving all of the the important physics, like the the le the divide length. And, okay. Well, yeah. And this is one dimensional, two dimensional. This was just a one dimensional. So th this is really just a a, a basic uh, simulation, just to see if things seem to make sense for the first mm -hmm. look. The the tearing instability is the one that's more interesting to see. If there's more things that could break. I, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. And yeah, so here, here I'm showing the two, uh, Relsim versus Osiris, uh, and you see, so this this was the case where we had um, a lot of resolution. So you see that this thing is lower than what you have in in Relsim, um, but but overall, um, we're getting basically the same results. It, it, it's a little bit worse the the number that we're getting here, but um, I think this this is something that you can just account for. The resolution is not exactly the same, and um, and for sure there's less particles per cell here. Um, and that makes that first beginning state up higher. Yeah, exactly. So you don't have as much of that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the 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 takeaway message from this slide is just that both of these have uh, growth rates which match the theory reasonably well, um, and so Relsim is giving uh, good results. And also, it, it's nice to see that a lot of these these things that that you see, which are not necessarily part of the um, the two stream, uh, the regular theory, also is recovered. So we we see some wave that's growing here. That um, okay. yeah. Is there a reason that you didn't use exactly the same number of particles yeah. per cell? 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you want to compare them, yeah, it would it would be better to to yes. show this to, to say that uh, exactly. It's actually, it's, you're uh, saying it's I, I don't yeah. want to challenge you, right, right. Object, but uh, if it's a you know if it's a if it's a test of how well right it works, uh, then one would hope for better agreement. Mm -hmm. Then you know if you have. 0.16 versus 0.14. Right. It's like 10% difference. I mean, is, it, is it good enough? Yeah. Or, so, I mean, the, yeah, I think it's before like, I would publish it, I would want to make it a, a yeah. really nice. So you're uh, saying this is thing. work in progress. This, 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 this like is work in progress. Yeah. Now, there's no reason you couldn't do exactly the same. No, yeah. no, I could, I could, yeah. I could definitely do that. Uh, uh, you did I miss this when you're doing the rel sim are you taking advantage of the semi implicit in terms of a bigger grid um space and longer time step or is this or are those comparable to at, at this point they're comparable so this okay. is this is just a more expensive one than this one uh, except for the fact that I did many particles per cell uh, just to test if, if we're getting reasonable results um but yeah yeah, I could always go in, in more detail, but mainly I just wanted to see whether the stuff that Fabio did is consistent in OSIRIS. Okay. We, don't, um, we don't really expect RELSIM to be outperforming the explicit because this is a one-dimensional problem and really you get more returns with higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so this is, def this is definitely not the problem you'd want to, to try to take advantage of RELSIM. Right, yeah. So, but this is not yet a test of yeah. how uh, advantageous it is. Right, right. It's exactly. Just, uh, it's a test of accuracy. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so so this this was just the first test to see uh, that that things seem to make sense. Um, and so in the next section, I'm going to uh, go in, into a bit of depth about the tearing instability for an a collisionless problem. Um, so particularly, I'm looking at this uh, this Harris sheet. Um, and I'm going to do this with Osiris to try to see what is it that we would expect before we actually do some uh, rel sim mm -hmm. uh, simulations to see how, what happens. Um, and just as a refresher and to, to see what some of these uh, uh, symbols that I'm using here, um, the tearing mode starts out with a, a current sheet. So this is the current that's coming out of the page in the Z direction. So the Y direction is this direction, the X is this way. Uh, and the thickness I'm going to call lambda here. Um, and so you have oppositely, oppositely directed fields. Um, and then once tearing happens, you start breaking up the, the current sheet into different islands like this. Uh, and yeah, so you break the, the frozen in condition. You take the energy from the magnetic fields and put it into some flows and heat. Um, and so this, this is the initial state before reconnection uh, really gets started. Uh, but yeah, so this is just a cartoon so that you have an idea of what you're looking at uh, when I talk about growth rates and everything. Okay, so in this slide, I wanted to uh, give a, a general picture of, of some of the theoretical growth rates for the tearing instability uh, when in a uh, collisionless regime. Um, and so this paper, Beta 2022, he had, he looked at many different uh, growth rates from in, in different regimes. Um, and so I'm just showing a couple of them in the regime where uh, where it's collisionless. And just to make sure, so this is all for non-relativistic or next to nine plasma or what? Yeah, at, at this, this point, this is all non-relativistic. Um, yeah, electron ion, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it, it also works for electron positron. Um, okay. But at least the, the ones that I'm going to transition into definitely work for both. Um, but yeah, so this depends on, uh, there's two parameters. One the question is the electron inertia length versus the Larmor radius. So if this is very big, this is a cold uh, type of plasma, you have these, these expressions. And when uh, you have a hotter plasma where the Larmor radius is similar to the, the electron inertia length, we have these. Uh, and then I wanted to give an explanation of this delta prime. So he looks at both the regime of small and large delta prime. Um, and this is defined by this, this equation from the outer solution. So we're looking at this BY, which is the, uh, the field which grows when you have the tearing instability. Uh, and you will have a 
a slope of by which changes suddenly in the center and so it, this is a plot from a paul Kasich's thesis where he had uh where we looked at different values of delta prime uh, and you can see here that the slope suddenly changes directions here at the center where the frozen in condition is broken um and when delta prime is bigger than one it's unstable when it's less than one so something like this then it's stable and you can have solutions both when delta prime is very small less than one delta times he calls it a but this is our lambda uh, or the large regime the the plus zero minus zero notation is just like the slope on either side exactly okay. yeah the slope on one side of zero and the other side of zero. so i was just wondering what the value of delta prime because I was thinking that it is a delta function that comes in because it's changing the direction, right? Because by is changing the direction, right? So, so the, the BX is the is the the background magnetic field, and and this is the BY, which is the it, it's the the mode which is growing okay. uh, for the instability. Yeah. And are all of these with zero guide field. Uh, so it doesn't matter. At this point, it doesn't matter. Then I'm going to add a guide field and then get rid of it. So, okay. <laughs> so um, if we look at a Harris equilibrium, um, then so this this is the Harris equilibrium uh, mm -hmm. for people that are, are not familiar with it. You have this Tanch profile uh, where you have these oppositely directed fields in the x direction, like I was saying before, uh, and it has this lambda. Uh, scale difference. And then you have a density that has this secant squared uh, form. Uh, and then you have a constant uniform drift velocity and temperature. Um, and when you have this this sort of uh, equilibrium, you have a, a force balance where the magnetic field upstream and the, the pressure in the center are, are equal. And that makes it so that DE and rho tend to be about the same order because you, you have a temperature here that's determined by the magnetic field. Um, and and so I circled this solution because it seems to match pretty well with the things that we're interested in. Um, so like I said, these things are, are about the same in the force balance. Um, why it's a small delta prime? Not so obvious, but that's the one that, that seems to match very well. Um, now let's assume that we have this guide field, uh, and and so that can define rho ls in the center of the the current sheet, uh, where you don't have any magnetic field. Um, and so then we can have rho ls, which is this equation here, and de, which one over de, which is this equation here, um, and you have a term up here which is proportional to b zero, and this b which is the defining, uh, it's defined by the guide field. Um, and so this is proportional to B0 over BZ, or I'm going to call this a, a BZ. Um, and so this form is a nice form because it, it fits with some other uh, literature of uh, the tearing instability in a collisionless plasma. Um, and so, yeah, in uh, Jim Drake's paper in 76, he looked at uh, a transition from collisionless to collisional. But in the collisional regime, or collisionless regime, you have uh, this form, which is exactly what we saw here with, with some actual uh, oh, numerical, numerical three factors, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and so in his paper, he assumed that this BZ is very big. Um, but it turns out that uh, in another paper from Zellini in 79. Yeah. Zelloni. Zelloni. Yeah. Zelloni just means green. It means uh, green. Okay. Yeah. Colored green. Mm -hmm. So so he found that this is also true in the in the other regime where where BZ is much less than one. Um and so you can see his equation here is basically the same as uh the the, the equation from Drake uh with a factor of K lambda, which is the border one. Um, and so, yeah, I want, I've, this paper is, is particularly of interest because it seems to match pretty well with most of the simulations that I do. And and I want to, to use this kind of as a reference. Um, although I think you should more trust the, the 
pitch simulations than this theory because it's, it's, it gives you a good good reference of what you should expect, but not exact. Um, and so, yeah, he looked at the transition from when you have this BZ being very small, if it gets small enough, um, then this thing would blow up. So if BZ gets, goes to zero, then you would have an infinite growth rate. So this doesn't make sense. Um, and so it turns out that there's a transition um, when this ratio of the electron inertia length to the thickness of the current sheet. So if you have a, uh, yeah, so when this BZ gets less than that, then it's unmagnetized. Uh, and rather than having a a factor of DE over lambda squared, you have something to the three halves. Um, and then, yeah, I define this eta E, which ends up being one plus TI over TE. And what's nice about this is this is both true. Uh, his model is independent of the mass ratio. Um, so as long as his assumption is that lambda over de and lambda over di is very big. So as long as that's that's big enough, um, then there shouldn't be any strong mass ratio dependence. Sorry, say it again. Sorry, okay. Sorry. So, the, the, uh, so sorry. yeah. Okay. So there are kind of several limits here. So yeah. Several inequalities. Mm -hmm. So one is you're saying that there is a transition. Yes. You know, between like large guide field regime and small guide. The regime based on, on this condition, right? The quantity on the right hand side of this conditions. So if you ignore eta, yeah. So it's basically d over lambda. Right. So the theory is derived in the limit when d over lambda is small. It's small. It's yes. small. Okay. Yeah. So that's an assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if it's small, then the, the critical value of the guide field is also small. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah, you, you want it to be very, very small guy field so that it's essentially zero. Um, yeah. And so then one of the main reasons why I was interested in his paper is that he looks at the regime where you have relativistic temperatures sorry, as well. Sorry, can you go yeah. back to the Go back, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so lambda is, this is the initial thickness of the sheet, yes. right? Yes. It's a linear theory, so we just mm -hmm. concerned with this initial current shift. Uh, and then you have DE. Uh, it doesn't matter what. So DE must be much, much smaller than lambda. It doesn't right. matter whether DI is much smaller than lambda or not. Uh, yes. Yes. So he assumes that both of them, uh, that lambda is much bigger than both of them. Oh, OK. Right. Uh, Okay, there, sure. there, are, there are other papers that look at the other regime, but but okay, this is his that's, 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 okay. yeah. And so, so in that case, yes, of course. So then D is really mm -hmm. much much smaller. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, what I was uh, saying a, a bit ago is one of the main reasons that I was interested in this paper is that it does the transition from non-relativistic to to strongly relativistic temperatures. Um, so. We have this equation that, that I showed previously. Uh, and this DE over lambda, it turns out that we have an expression here that the ratio of DE over lambda and the Larmor radius over lambda and the drift velocity compared to the thermal velocity tend, are, are, are all the same, uh, the same parameter with, within a factor of this eta. Um, and th this, this is assuming that we're in a Harris sheet, uh, which, which I said earlier. Um, but using this, you can rewrite this equation in terms of uh, the drift velocity compared to the speed of light. And it also depends on the thermal velocity. Um, but you can also, but yeah, this is the non-relativistic -relativist, regime that I've been talking and comparing with old papers before. But he also introduces this relativistic regime, um, which looks moderately the same as what we have here, except for a different prefactor. and it no longer depends on the thermal velocity, which is what you expect, because when the temperature is much greater than one, the thermal velocity compared to the speed of light is also on the order of one. Okay, so so now so, I'm sorry, yeah. Then, oh, Let's no, go back. Yeah. Sort of clarifying question. Mm -hmm. And all of this is in the small delta prime regime. So there is also delta prime. You have you know small and 
So it, it matches quite well with this small delta prime regime in the in, in the literature, which I was showing previously. But he actually, as far as I understand, doesn't assume anything to do with delta prime. So delta prime is of order one. Oh. Um, and his his fastest growing mode, the theory it says that you should get a delta prime of order one for a error sheet. Um, and so yeah, it, it's it's nice that we don't have to make any assumption on delta prime. Um, and so, so now I'm actually going to compare this with the simulations. So, so with Osiris simulations, um, I tried to test this this model by by looking at different values of the the temperature, the thermal velocity, um, and and then different values of lambda over de. Um, okay, I made a mistake here. Here, so we were saying. These values, lambda de five or two point five, are even though they're not very large numbers, which they need to be uh, for the theory to be formally correct, uh, they seem to be small enough to get pretty good uh, agreement with the theory. So are these electron positrons. The, the, yeah, these simulations are ele electron positrons. Okay. So they're uh, in in later uh, slides. I'm going to look into the point where they're. Uh, where they have ions as well. But uh, for now, especially for this tearing, I'm looking at the, the electron positron um, theory. So in, in principle, according to his theory, as long as you have um, lambda over di significantly bigger than one, which maybe 2.5 is enough. Uh, the, the, uh, the growth rate also depends on k. Yes. Is this for fastest growing mode? Or exactly. How, what, what chooses k? Yeah, right? this, 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 this is the next point I wanted to make. So this, oh, okay. this, this k lambda here, it it is according to the theory one over the square root of three, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that that's what these are here. Um, but you can actually see it in this simulation. Exactly. Oh, so, okay. So that's what we. we <laughs> just let you go. Okay. So that's what we looked here. So so we looked, took the Osiris simulations and took the FFT of of by in in both the the y direction and the x direction, um, and so this this is kind of the worst case scenario that I looked at uh, where. So we took lambda over de is 2.5, which is not so big, uh, and the the temperature is quite relativistic. Um, and the theory is one over the square root of three, but as you see here, this is about 0.4, which is within a factor of two off. So it's 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 still pretty good. Um, and as I was saying in in the previous slides, uh, this this Zolani model, Zolani model is. Uh, it gives you within an order of magnitude correct. It's not exact anyway. So, um, so it was one of them. So, what do you say? It's pretty. Uh, so one over square root of three is what? One over square root of three is is the the expected maximum right. growth. It's rate. one over one point seven. Okay. It the oh, oh okay point yeah. five eight is, is the exact value. Oh, okay. Um, point five. Yeah. Right. And and so. I did another uh, plot here where I'm looking at a, a better. Uh, I, I looked at all of the different ones, but th these were two examples. This was was a very good one. The other one was a very bad one. Mm. Oh, so uh, I missed the change. So you just changed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this one is over the e, and this way yeah. we just changed. Yeah. So, so, so no. we had these these values here, and then we changed those values. And so you're, this is you set up an initial Harris sheet. Yes. Yeah. And I assume no. So this is exactly, right? I mean, it's yeah, exactly it's just from the noise. Exactly and from, from right, starting from the right that it is, it's kind of an estimate. Uh -huh. Right, right. Okay. And then this is a, a just a 2D Fourier transform of dy after some time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is this is long enough that we're in the this linear regime of the growth rate. Um, and yes, so the theory says that it should be one over the square root of three. Uh, and if you look here, this this is happening pretty much exactly at 0.58. Mm -hmm. and in order to get any more resolution, you'd really have to do huge simulations. So uh, okay. that, that's about as good as you can get. And should we expect, so what should we expect from KY? Should that no. be about the same as KX for round plasmoids? Actually, yeah. So you know, KY is, I don't really know why you're plotting KY. Right, maybe it's... it's Sort of maybe it can be useful, maybe not. But what, what's important here, or what you would expect here, is that this should be about the thickness of the current sheet. So, or on the order of okay. k lambda equal one, 
uh, because this is you're you're looking at something the height of the plasma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they start growing bigger than that, then you're not in the linear regime anymore. But then you could have some different right. different case. But kx is the important thing that you want to look at at these right. plots, and and so you, you see these lines across here where um, okay. it's the fastest model. Okay, so so here is a similar plot than what I showed earlier when I was looking at the two stream, uh, where now we're looking at different parts of the magnetic field. The And I also show the Harris versus the background or the electrons versus the ions, which the sum of those is the same. Um, and so BY is, is the mode that we want to see growing. And so we can see a growth rate here. Um, we have a fit, which is pretty reasonably close to the theory. Um, again, it's Factor of two. <laughs> Sorry, if you look at your plot, yes, it says zero. Uh, that, that, <laughs> it's it's much smaller. Than, it's it's zero point zero zero one. <laughs> but yes, these are the numbers that yeah, okay. it's important so, to look at. Then. Right. Yes. So these numbers, like theory and fit, look suspiciously similar to square root three divided by a thousand, square root three divided by a thousand. Is there anything there? Or then, I mean, something like one point four and one point seven three. Is there something there, or is this? I, I doubt it. I think <laughs> I think it's a bit of a coincidence of what what these numbers are. Um, okay, so <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, as I look at all the different sim, uh, different uh, answers because, with different yeah. simulations, you get a wide variety. So, right. uh, so uh, it depends on lambda over d. Right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I presume now you will show us what it looks like for five. Right? Um, so actually, this is for, for 2 this is for two point five. What I'm going to look at now is is what happens when you change the temperature. Oh, the temperature. Uh, so this is this is the relatively cold temperature. So yeah. you didn't show any real space pictures, and you, because this is in the linear regime, are we at a point where you really wouldn't see anything? Because generally, once you start seeing things pinching off, I guess you're already going non-linear. Mm -hmm. But if you were to look at the the Harris sheet yeah. with this state of tearing, would you actually see sort of more or less a regular ripple, um, you know, at the K that you expect, or is it more noisy than that? So yeah, in in this linear regime, like uh, yeah. around these times, um, it, it you you don't see so much pinching and everything, and and you get a, a really nice value of your K, uh, which is from theory, but then it becomes more complicated in this nonlinear regime over here. And I will show some of those plots as we go. Um, but yeah, th this is a nice transition because what, what I want to focus a little bit on is as we increase the temperature, something happens at this nonlinear stage. Um, and so you can see that we have a growth rate here that matches pretty well with, with the theory again. And as you see here, it's different numbers. Uh, and and but you see this this faster growth at, at the the later time, which which this is a, a fully nonlinear part. Um, and as you get to more and more relativistic cases, this this becomes more and more pronounced. Uh, and so you can see something here that uh, it seems to be interesting and and an important thing to consider. Uh, and especially one thing that I wanted to point out here is so I'm measuring here this. This fit, which fits pretty well with the, the theoretical growth rate, but you might not even, it's not clear where you should be measuring this. It, it doesn't really have a, a long period of, of, of time where, where it's growing in a. Because those vertical lines are put in sort of by eye, and that's where you're doing the fit over. Um, so with the vertical lines the, are blue lines. The, the blue lines, I, the blue lines. I guess I, I did it initially from here, where it, where it seems to fit pretty well. And then I increased the. The temperature keeping those vertical lines the same, and at this point, there, there's no reason that I should pick those points. Uh, while at the earlier times it made a little bit more sense, although the agreement is kind of suggestive, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, but if you were to start with this one and say, Oh, where should I do the fit? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be obvious, obvious, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, uh there's an interesting thing if you try to measure the this region here where you have a fastest slope. Um, so yeah, I, first I'm pointing out here that this seems to be growing exponentially, which is really fast because we're already looking at uh, a log scale where the yeah. a, a linear line is exponential. Mm -hmm. um, 
and eventually it grows up to to this fastest mode. And it turns out that uh, if you assume rather than this lambda over d equals two point five, that lambda over d e is one, which is kind of the maximum growth rate that you could assume because in, this theory. in, in the theory, if lambda is uh, smaller than d e, then it it breaks down and it doesn't work. And I'm going to show that when that this gets too small, then you you don't get a faster growth. It it, it ends up going slower. But isn't this to be expected that in when you get nonlinear, you have exponent collapse? Yeah, I, uh, I suppose so. Yes. Um. So what I found interesting here is that that it does match this, and this this you can sort of explain why this is happening. Um. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess one of the things that I'm going to try, it's not clear to me yet, but it seems to be that uh, this may be the case that this this growth, which is this explosive growth where it's exponentially exponential, uh, maybe from the onset, from the even early time where it's hard to measure at the low scale where we have a lot of noise, but it, it may be that you never have a, truly linear regime where it, it grows at a constant rate. Um, and yeah, so I said that this matches this lambda over DE equals one for, for this simulation, but I checked all of them uh, that, that I was just showing you previously. So these were were, were the, all the plots that I showed before. Um, but now I'm including these this X, which is a measurement of this fastest growing uh, nonlinear stage where it, it's not really a, a, hmm. a growth so rate. The circles here as before. The circles are this linear, this linear regime. And yeah. They agree pretty well. And for, for lambda d over five, equal five, it's. For both. Well, I don't know whether it's better or not. Does it improve? For both lambda d over five and lambda d of 2.5. It, I don't really see a clear improvement. Maybe it's a bit better with five, uh, okay. but I, it would be hard to this claim last that. This point uh, stands out. This one or this no, one. The, the one. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think there are, okay. there are some issues there to, to, to really see, but it, okay. it it seems to fit pretty well. Uh -huh. And for each simulation, you in addition to the linear circles, mm -hmm. linear stage, it's also a process. Exactly. And which all should get that. Exactly. And so it doesn't matter whether you're five or 2.5, it always pushes up to about the same value, which is basically the maximum you could imagine this growth rate when DE over lambda equals one. Mm -hmm. And okay, here, here's one of the the pictures of of uh, the islands where you're pinching it and everything. And this is at the, the fully nonlinear regime where it's at this fastest growth. Um, and so the explanation of, why this might be happening um, is as as this mode grows, you get a lower density uh, at the X point. Um, and as the density drops, DE gets bigger. Um, uh, actually, so just yeah. to ask, uh, so this is Harris sheet equilibrium. This is Harris sheet equilibrium. What is the over density factor? So what's the ratio of upstream density to, to Harris sheet density? So this this is actually uh, no background. So oh, no background. So it's zero outside and one so it's in, in the center. center. Yeah. Uh, so D. Uh, so D E is measured with respect to the peak density. Exactly. Yeah. And so initially, this peak density is one, but then it gets down to it drops by a factor of ten. So here, this is something like one tenth. Mm -hmm. And um, so drops the D. Uh, Increases and reaches. Yeah, down. yeah. This 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 seems to be uh, at least a hand waving argument of why this 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 may be uh, happening. Uh, so at the fastest mode, lambda over d is about equal to one. So you, it required a density drop of two point two five, and it's ten, which is on on the right order. And eventually, yeah. at later times, it slows down. And so so that's actually quite interesting. So saying that. The ratio of lambda de evolves over time. Yeah, it can evolve not not only in this case perhaps not by changing lambda, by changing, mm -hmm. but by changing de. Yeah, because you are evacuating plasma from it. Exactly. Yeah. Can you just go back? So this is 
time 1000 and we're on the linear view go back to, linear. to the linear so that this is I see. here it, 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 during it, it's during this yeah. fastest growing mode so uh yeah once as you go later where the the, the density goes to zero then the growth rate ends up going down again and it just it, it saturates and and you have just vacuum reconnection basically um so you could explain it in different methods but this this seems to be uh, but it would be i mean if you had background density so it went back okay. then it would be something different if right you had something. right so it, eventually you would get to the point where it goes down to the background density and then um, it, it wouldn't keep growing at that that level. So if the background density is small enough, then you would see these these effects significantly. Um, so yeah, as as this tearing instability grows, the density decreases, the growth rate increases, uh, and as I've said before, this is increasing a, a growth rate that's increasing exponentially. So it's this explosive process. Uh, okay, so. What I've just looked at in the, the last few slides is the non-relativistic case. Uh, but now I want to look at what happens when you have uh, more relativistic temperatures and and also, well, yeah. So in a recent paper by Hoshino, uh, he looked at breaking one of the assumptions of, of Zellini's model where, so Zeloni said that uh, nu d over c must be much less than one. Um, but Hoshino looked at at least fixed simulations uh, where where this vd over c gets close to one. Um, and what he found is that it, it fits the model of, of Zeloni, but uh, it has this extra factor of one over gamma d, where gamma d is the Lorentz factor based on this drift velocity. Um, and so it turns out that the peak growth rate happens when when this u d, uh, which is gamma times the velocity, um, is about 0.8. Um, and if you go anywhere further than that, then it's going to get slower and slower growth rate. This is something I hadn't really thought about, but I mean, the Harris equilibrium is, you know, defined for a non-relativistic mm -hmm. um, plasma. Um, is there a rigorous relativistic Harris? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you're using. That's what I'm using. There's a, there's a paper by Kirk and Gears. There was yeah. some name. 2004. But yeah, so I'm using this this uh, exact model there. Um, okay, so by doing this, by taking this theory, then I can compare uh, not just the the non-relativistic case, which I did in the, the last few plots, but I'm I have this complex uh, plot here where I'm looking at uh, the growth rate along here versus the the temperature compared to the m c squared, and so. This line here uh, is is this transition between a, a non-relativistic temperature and a relativistic temperature, um, and so so these lines are the predictions of his theory. Uh, so which lines are you predicting? The, the the red, the green, and the blue. A different what? The, these are the the predicted growth rates from Zeloni's model. Sorry, so they correspond to different. The colors correspond to different different drift velocities. Drift velocities. Okay. Yeah. And so, then there are two I mean there are all kinds of lines and symbols. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I'm I'm going to slowly explain okay, all of them. Please. Uh the, the the first thing that you should get while looking at this plot is that we have these these lines here, which are the theory uh from Zalon. And uh, it, it includes this factor of one over gamma uh for these very strong drift velocities. Okay. Um and they don't match anything. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> the, the first thing that you see here is how it doesn't seem to match at all. But although there are some points, like uh, along here, this this is relatively good. Um, here, it's it's also OK. Uh, and here, uh, I guess something that I should point out here is that with Hoshino's model, it, it's not an exact number. So as long as it's within a factor of a few, 
um, it should be, it, it fits what he says. And so, uh, uh, sorry, and should, uh, so I guess crosses and circles still have the same meaning as before. Yes, exactly. So now when you say, so should we be looking at, first of all, at crosses or at circles? First so set circles. About, okay, so talking yeah. about linear. And state. particularly in this, in, in, in this regime over here is where it somewhat fits. So I, I said, these these points here seem to be reasonable agreement. This one's a reasonable agreement. And this one, it 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 shows this uh, independence of temperature, um, which Zaloni uh, predicted in his model. Um, and it's within a factor of uh, of a few uh, fitting with, with the Hoshino's model. Um, in, in this regime. Line? Okay, so that's that's the next thing that I wanted to, to point out here. Um, so one thing that that's important to note is when we take this uh, drift velocity as a constant and we decrease delta t, uh, then this lambda over d is not held constant. Um, and so as you move to lower and lower temperatures, eventually you're getting into a regime where our assumption that lambda over d is very big breaks down. Um, and so everything over in this regime, this 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 assumption that lambda over d is very big is is broken, um, and and so it turns out that the that this fits pretty well. This this limiting case where lambda over d e equals one, um, and so you you can't get a faster growth rate. So as, as I was saying there, as you move in this direction or in this direction. According to Zaloni's model, uh, it would keep growing, uh, but his assumption is is oh. broken down, and so it, it ends up following this lambda over de equals one rather than the the big values that you might expect over here. Um, and and this this seems to to match pretty well, so you can get a good good estimate of what kind of growth rates you would expect just by looking at lambda over de. Oh. Um, and then I want to point out a little bit more about those X's that um, that we had talked about a little bit before. Um, and so, yeah, all of the all of these simulations, you have the the growth here that fit the the model a bit, but then you have this nonlinear stage where it grows up um, to this regime where lambda over d e equals one. Um, and so that that seems to fit what we saw previously. Um, and the important thing that I'm finding here is that when you look at extremely relativistic temperatures, it's very hard to measure any sort of linear growth rate. And so I didn't even have points here that are uh, in a circle. Uh, they just quickly grow up to this fastest growth rate, uh, which again corresponds to lambda over d equals one. Okay, so, it's one so this is when you have relativistic. These are relativistic temperatures over here. Highly relativistic temperature. Yeah. But then independent of UD over C, even for small UD over C, it very quickly grows to, to so circles coincide with crosses basically. Right, right. Yeah. There basically is no circle measurement. There's no circle measurement. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's always growing having this. Uh, exponential growth of the exponential uh, growth and, and, until it hits yeah. that point where it's saturating. So why is it, is it Let's see. Well, I, I suppose I'm not not entire. I haven't thought way too much about why, and there's still an open question of whether I expect this to be if, if we're just not resolving things correctly for the um, non-relativistic case, and this is always true, or if if there is some transition where uh, this this nonlinear stage happens late in time, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it seems like in the relativistic case, our density drop seems to be faster, um, and so you get into this this uh, runaway process quicker. Um, okay, so this this slide is kind of the the takeaway message of what what we kind of expect when we're looking at uh, a tearing mode in in uh, in a collisionless plasma. So, so all of this so far is preliminary background. <laughs> exactly. Because this is all done with Osiris. <laughs> 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 exactly. Okay. Sorry. Um, 
Okay, so now I'm going to try to compare these methods and, and look at what happens uh, in tearing with the semi-implicit versus the, the, the big code. Um, and so first, I'm going to look at the electron positron, which we've been looking at previously with Osiris. Again, this is something that you don't get so much out of um, of doing the uh, the implicit model, but I'll move into that in, in the later ones. Um, and so, yeah, this, this is kind of what Fabio already did in his paper, uh, where we, we looked at, so these are the parameters that he had set up, where we have a, a temperature, which is relativistic, just at the border where it's one MC squared. Uh, we have this this UD over C equals 0.8. So this is already at the, the fastest growing mode. So you don't have to worry about this, this uh, exponential growth that eventually gets you to this regime. Uh, so yeah, lambda over DE equals one here. Um, and so this this is strongly, uh, or it's not way too big. It's, it's a factor of 10, but it's enough that you can essentially ignore this background at the initial stages. And at later stages, you you can keep having new plasma coming in. And so you now have a uniform background plasma? Yeah, now we have a uniform background plasma. So the, the density the ratio is the background. Yeah. The magnetization yeah. is the background. It's, it's the background magnetization, exactly. It's the background density. Yeah. And so, the, so, and the, so this is the background temperature. This is called yeah, the, uh, mm -hmm. the ground with the density ratio of 6. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is still electron positron? Yeah. And this no, is yeah, and no guide field. No guide field. Pair uh, two D. Yes. Um, and yeah, if we if we look here, the fit is within a factor of of two, uh, from from the the theoretical growth rate. Um, and you don't expect it to be perfect, because this lambda over de is is one and not a very big number. But de, sorry, which de is this? This is. This is DE of the of, at the center of the current sheet. Well, so does that have relativistic correct? Is this the relativistic expression for DE or non-relativistic? This is the non-relativistic. Because for relativistic yeah. liquid plasma, DE is different. Sure, it's sure. Different. Yeah. In this yeah. case, it wouldn't be two different though. Right. It's one, it's one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is, in both cases, it's about that, but but this this is the the value for the the non-relativistic case. Um, okay, so these are are some pictures of the of the by signature. Um, so we have these the, this kx mode, which is the the, the initial linear tearing mode. Uh, this point here is is at that point where it's growing the fastest, uh, and it, it's already getting into this nonlinear regime. Um, and at this late time, it's already at it's used most of the energy and it is has gotten to a, a steady state um, and it's saturated. And if we look at the density, e even at this nonlinear regime, since this, sorry, uh, previous yeah. was what? Yes, this is BY. BY. Yeah. And so this, this one is the density. Um, and so since this is this relativistic regime, even at early times, you already can see some significant changes in the density. Um, and by this regime, uh, yeah, the, this has gone very low, and this is why you would, could get this this fast growth rate. Although even from the beginning, lambda over de is one, so it's not going to change the growth rate too much. Um, yeah. And okay, so now I'm looking at the the implicit method results. Uh, we see something that looks very similar. Um, so actually, I, I'm not showing by; I'm showing the other one, so it's not exactly the same here, but uh, everything else matches with what we saw there. And now I'm going to show the same plots that I showed previously. Uh, and you see essentially the same the same phenomenon. You see this, this K mode here uh, of the tearing at the linear stage. You start seeing uh, some merging and, uh, and a, a later stage here. And then finally, uh, it saturates. Uh, and you can see essentially the same thing that we showed with with uh, Osiris with Relsim here, uh, where we have the linear stage, uh, the nonlinear stage, and then this saturated stage. OK, so yeah, the bottom line here is it, this seems to match pretty well. It's consistent with Fabio's paper um, that we have the same, uh, that 
RelSim can capture these these two problems. Uh, so now I want to look at uh, relativistic tearing, um, where we have this electron ion regime. Um, and so, so here I'm doing similar temperature equals one, although I, I'm looking at a regime where we have lambda over DE being big. Um, and so, so we end up seeing this, this uh, nonlinear stage here. Okay, um, sorry, okay, but this is electron ion. So what is? This is electron ion, yeah. So, or parameters. So yeah, I guess this. Ion temperature, what do you mean? So yeah, the the temperature sure. the temperature is the same for everything. Okay. Um. So the the ion temperature, the electron temperature, the back uh, there is no background, so it's just so. So, so ions are non relativistic. Ions are non relativistic. And, yeah. Uh, and the mass ratio is. The mass ratio is a hundred. Hundred. Yeah. And and so this lambda over de is is ten, um. So that lambda over di is one. Uh, and and so then we can get something that that should more or less match the theory. Um, and so these these are are the computational parameters here. We're having four thousand particles per cell, sixteen. Uh, we're resolving the the thickness of the current sheet by sixteen. So that's uh, close to di de. Um, and yeah, we're also just just resolving the the by length here. Um, yeah, so so what I'm seeing here is that the fit compared to the theory seems to to be reasonable here, um, and we see this this growth um, of the, the, this faster growth. So this again, this is this is with Osiris so far. So I'm going to eventually compare this with with Exon or the Relson. Um, now, one thing that, that I tested here, like I did before, we looked at the different numbers of particles per cell. Uh, but unlike previously, where it just had a longer time to find your growth rate, um, we see that there are some changes that are happening um, as you increase the particles per cell. And you kind of need a lot of resolution to, or a lot of particles per cell to get something that, that is uh, the, the final result. Um, so at this low 64 particles per cell, we see the growth rate, which is not perfect. It, it's it, it's uh, a bit off from, from the theory, uh, but we never really get this, this uh, fast growth initially. Um, and as you increase the particles per cell, uh, you start seeing a little bit of growth here and more and and here you start seeing uh, a significant amount of this this uh nonlinear stage um and so again we're in this picture where you don't really have a big regime where you can calculate a growth rate although the growth rate seems to fit better and better as we get to more particles per cell um so i didn't go even further to see if if you can not measure it at all but uh at least here we have a reasonable measurement of growth rate, and then it has this this uh, later stage that we saw uh, in the previous simulations. We have a question about when you say the nonlinear growth rate. When you show the real space pictures, yeah, you start with the tearing, which has a fairly small k and a bunch yeah. of islands. Then the islands, I guess, they're merging, and mm -hmm. um, so somehow the k seems to be getting smaller. Yes. So when you measure by, is that the by at the Dominant K, or is it some other measure? Um, mm. Yeah, that, that when you do this curve, what exactly? Right, this is a good point. That curve should uh, plot. So, so I just did the, the the simple assuming that we have the same fastest growing mode uh, that you would have linearly. But yeah, as you say, this is an important thing that I didn't take into account that we really have big, much smaller Ks at these later times uh, as as the merging is yeah. taking effect. And this may have an effect for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, so this this, this is, is a real seam, right? No, so far this is all Osiris. This is again Osiris. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes sometimes you show what is 
spread. Okay, yeah. so this is the size. Okay. Yeah, so we we had everything fully resolved, and then we increased the, the, the particles per grid uh, to pretty high values in order to get something here that looks at least reasonable. Um, and yeah, there, it's still a question of how much more would you have to go before you get something that's really uh, where it gets a converged, converged exactly. Um, and yeah, maybe this has something to do with the numerical heating, and you need more particles so that you don't so that you can resolve this. But uh, next, I I compare what happens with the implicit method, and so here I didn't resolve these spatial scale so much. So this used to be sixteen with with the with the other case, and now it's only four. And also, I only needed sixteen particles per grid. At least for this simulation, I, I would like to do some bigger ones later. Um, but yes, these are all two D. Um, so, so here, th this is the the plot from from Exim, um, and but Exim, you don't have the by, so I also made a plot here that was just by, um, and yeah, we see this. This fit is reasonably well at the beginning. And then after about one E folding, it, you already start getting this growth of, of this, this fast nonlinear stage, which is in agreement with the this high resolution, like expensive Osiris simulation. Um, so can you explain yeah. why do you think, why is lambda over dx equals four reasonable? Why is lambda? So this, I mean, for example, this means yeah. you're no longer resolving the divide length with respect to the drifting plasma. Mm -hmm. but not, also, you're not resolving DE. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And where is the Larmor radius? Are you resolving that? So, so yeah, the Larmor radius, yeah, it's similar to DE. Um, and so, so here I'm resolving the ion Larmor radius, but not the electron Larmor radius. And so the idea is if if the ion physics connects with some electron physics that could be thick or small, is is, is uh, you may get the same sort of results as long as is the electron scale is doing the correct things. It's just the size is not correct if you wanted to measure um, what, what's happening there. OK, but uh, essentially it sounds like this is sort of an experiment yeah. Like a priori, it's not clear that neglecting this electron physics won't make a critical difference in, right, right. in mode growth rate. Yeah. 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 So basically the the takeaway message from what I've done here is that it seems like you could get, get some gains with this, these, these sort of problems. Um but actually testing to see if it, it works perfectly is is still future work. And we we I couldn't really say that this is uh, that I should be able to trust this this simulation yeah, very well. At some yeah. point, we'd like to see uh, not plots like on the left, where you show mm -hmm. many many quantities. Yeah. From one simulation, then on the next slide, you show the same kind of plot for a different simulation. You can't. But to compare the two. Right? Yeah. You want to compare one quantity on the plot, yeah. right, from different simulations. Mm -hmm. See whether they agree or not. Right. So right. And also, as you change, uh, let's say, lambda with the x. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so the next thing that I wanted to to show is uh, the explicit and the implicit versions of, of of some of these. So, for example, this is the early uh, linear stage. Um, we see the same sort of things that we saw in the electron positron where we have this this kx mode uh, that has to do with the tearing and if you do this fft um, again you see this this fastest growing mode which is within an order of magnitude or within the factor of 2 um, to the what we expect um, now this this is maybe something that's interesting to look at this ky versus kx uh, that in in this region you see this lower um, lower ky mode, which is I would say is associated with the ions, 
Uh, and then you have this higher K mode, uh, which is probably associated with this electron physics at the, the center. And so you, you, you can see both of those happening um, while, while this occurs. Okay, uh, so now I will show what, what we got with the implicit, the semi-implicit model. Um, and we're basically recovering the same physics, uh, although it's a little bit more noisy. Um, but yeah, we have this fastest, grow, fastest growing mode, which seems to, to, to fit more or less well. We have, we have this, this K mode. You, you can't really see this electron uh, scale difference, which makes sense because we're not resolving the, the electrons uh, the same that we did for the OSIRIS simulation. Um, then we can also look at the nonlinear stage um, where you start seeing these, these pinching regions here where you, you can see the density going down a bit. Um, and you see it's a little bit more washed out and noisy, but you're essentially seeing the same sort of thing for the, um, for the semi-implicit simulation results. And then finally, if we look at the saturation stage, it turns out that they they look almost identical. So we have we have these these big islands that that grow at the later stage, and you see something very similar here for the semi-implicit model. And e even the the noise, uh, since this thing has grown to a nonlinear stage, the, the signal to noise is pretty pretty high in both cases. Okay, so now this is a final uh, set of simulations that I, I started looking into uh, where I'm just looking at explicit simulations, but in principle, it's something that we might be able to look at uh, in the future. Um, and so these are much bigger system size. So it's LX over Lambda of a thousand. And just for comparison, what was it in the previous simulations you've been showing? Uh, it was 20. 20, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, so here we have uh, a strongly relativistic temperature, uh, a relativistic drift. Um, so in, in this case, this lambda over di is pretty small. So uh, it's it's not as good for looking at the, these initial um, tearing growth rates, but we can at least see if they are reasonable. Uh, so this is actually a very high density difference in the center. Uh, because we want to look at these these really strong, uh, strongly magnetized uh, plasmas, um, and yeah, again, we could. This initial stage is basically what we've been looking at before, except for the fact that uh, it's in this regime where lambda over d is closer to one. Um, and so, if we look at this evolution of the, the magnetic field, you get many of these. Sorry, which code? This is Osiris. Yeah. So yeah, we can see many of these little uh, islands generated. They start merging, um, and they they get to be about the size of the the whole system. Um, and then if you keep going, they continue to merge, uh, and then the the plasma coming from up and from the top and bottom will cause these um, secondary islands, which can continue to take the energy from the magnetic field and put it into um, into flows, heat, and nonlinear uh, or non-thermal particles. Uh, and eventually, we run out of, of uh, magnetic energy here. And so you can see that a little bit better if we look at the, uh, this is the density. Um, we see here that once these things are all merged, we have a, a current sheet that's, that, that stays there as we keep pulling in plasma. And then you start getting these magnetic islands generated, which can help to, to cause this. Um, and here, you see that there's really no more uh, unreconnected flux. So this is the final stage. Um, and so with these kind of problems, we can start to look at these spectral slopes of the these energetic particles. Um, and we, we get here an alpha of negative 1.2, which is similar to some of these papers that you and uh, Guo have been working on back in 2016. And so, yeah, this is this is kind of an exciting new thing that we could 
eventually look into where we went if we went to look at really big system sizes that you couldn't resolve so well with an explicit code. Um, and so, yeah, I would be interested to see what we can do with that in the future. Uh, but yeah, from now on, I guess this is the conclusion. So we have this semi-implicit method, method uh, that allows us to do this under resolution and look into new new regimes that we couldn't do before. Um, and we explored this tearing instability and uh, showed that this is something that we could eventually use to really test the implicit versus the explicit model. Um, we, we have this Zolini model, which, Zolini model, which seems to fit pretty well. And uh, and we have this explosive nonlinear growth rate, which I'd like to understand a little bit more uh, as we go. Uh, but yeah, the bottom line with with RELSIM, we can really push into these new new uh, regimes, and we hope to look into that in the future. Sorry. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.